Steam locomotives come in all shapes and sizes to do all manners of work. Be it compact to make it easier shunting around mines and factories, or ridiculously large to haul long, heavy goods trains over steep gradients. Naturally, the more impressive and eye-catching engines tend to be much bigger and grand in appearance, but there exists one engine that reminds us that size isn't everything. In 1892, work began on a new line for the Lancashire, Derbyshire and East Coast Railway connecting Chesterfield to Lincoln, along with the construction of several other branch lines. Businessman William Burkett and his brother Samuel dealt in seed and corn, with William running business in West Norfolk while Samuel operated in Chesterfield. Samuel farmed 385 acres of land along the new railway line, and so William had an interest in the line's development, not only as it would be beneficial to their business, but also because he was somewhat of a rail enthusiast. William Burkett thus decided he wanted his own private engine, though it's not entirely known what his reasoning was for getting one. It's widely believed that he simply wanted an engine he could travel around in to do business, while others have speculated that it was for use on the dockyard railway he owned, or that it was simply an act of a businessman fulfilling a long-time dream of owning his own steam engine. Regardless, he contacted A. Dodman and Company Limited and ordered a locomotive. Dodman built traction engines and fairground equipment, but were known to repair smaller shunting engines for nearby railways, and so took on the job, creating from from scratch possibly the only steam locomotive in the company's history. By January of 1893, the engine was complete, and the result certainly looked like something cobbled together out of spare fairground parts. The engine was a tiny, single-driving 222. Its cylinders were 4 inches in diameter, its driving wheels were 3 foot 9 inches wide, it weighed just over 5 tons and stood a total of 7 foot 9 inches tall. To put that into perspective, Tally Hlin, a narrow gauge locomotive built nearly 30 years earlier, is longer, heavier and has bigger cylinders than this standard gauge design. Despite not having a cab, the engine did possess some basic comforts, such as passenger seating in place of its bunker and wooden wheels for a quieter and more comfortable ride. Named Gazelle, it was taken for a trial run from King's Lynn to Downham Market and back, where on the return trip, it reportedly averaged a speed of 43 miles an hour. It was taken back to the works for some minor adjustments before being handed over to Burkitt. In total, Gazelle had cost Burkitt about £250. In 1897, with permission from the railway, he travelled 105 miles on Gazelle from King's Lynn to Chesterfield, making the run in 5 hours and 10 minutes, and the return trip in 5 hours 25 minutes. Despite Gazelle proving to be a reliable little chariot, records indicate that it was rarely used by Burkitt, likely due to him pushing 70, and after his brother Samuel died in 1898, he seemingly never used it again. He tried to sell Gazelle in 1900, but with no luck, and as a result it was put to one side. William Burkitt died in 1906, and with nobody interested in keeping the engine, it was eventually sold to a scrap dealer in 1909. In 1911, Gazelle was picked up cheap by Colonel Stevens for use as an inspection engine on the Shropshire and Montgomeryshire Railway. After a few months of work, Stevens had Gazelle modified, converting it to an 042 with smaller driving wheels and a few smaller adjustments to help it run on the line. Once the line was fully opened in 1912, passenger traffic was very light, and so Gazelle was repurposed again as a passenger engine. But instead of pulling a carriage, passengers would ride on the seats in Gazelle's bunker. After a complaint from a local vicar, Stevens had Gazelle fitted with a cab and a separate compartment for passengers. The compartment had a luggage rack fixed on its roof, which was a foot lower than that of the cab, was entirely enclosed with small windows, a door that only half filled the doorway left passengers exposed to the elements, and was described as having all the welcome appearance of a portable prison cell. 
It's likely Gazelle was only used like this on quiet days, but by 1916 it was decided it would be much better if it instead pulled a carriage. The carriage was made of an old horse-drawn tram that had been modified to run on the railway, as any other conventional carriage would have likely been too heavy to pull. The introduction of rail motors to the line and a decrease in traffic resulted in Gazelle being stripped down in Kinnerley Yard by 1932. However, William Austin, who took over from Colonel Stevens, felt Gazelle still had some use, and put it back to work in 1937 as an inspection engine and for pulling private parties. The Shropshire and Montgomeryshire Railway was eventually taken over in 1941 by the War Department, due to all the factories and ammunition storage sites it served. Obviously Gazelle wasn't cut out for the goods work, but did still help the railway by running ahead of important trains to ensure all points were set correctly and to counteract any attempts to sabotage the line, occasionally moving small loads of ammunition. Gazelle came out with a few war wounds for its trouble too, losing the top of its chin chimney and being bashed in a shunting accident. A petrol trolley soon took over Gazelle's job, and it once again ended up stored in a siding. But for many of the men working the line, Gazelle had become a sort of mascot. As such, when British Railways took over the line in 1950, they gave it to the War Department on permanent loan. Gazelle was put on display at the Longmoor Military Railway, later moving between various museums before finally making its home at the Colonel Stevens Railway Museum at Tenterden. It's still debated whether or not Gazelle is the smallest standard gauge steam locomotive in the world. I suppose it depends on how you measure it. But for an engine of its size, especially one built out of spare fairground equipment and traction engine parts, to go through so much, you have to admit it certainly earned its place in preservation. Just goes to show that biggest doesn't always mean best, and that the little things can often go a long way. Subscribe for more.